On occasion, you may be exposed to or have the need to use a liquefied or compressed gas such as oxygen or nitrogen in your workplace. Some liquefied gases are cryogenic, which means they are extremely cold and are measured at temperatures below a minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit. These cryogenic gases include oxygen, nitrogen, argon, helium, and hydrogen. Please note, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide are liquefied gases but do not fit the definition of cryogenics because their temperatures are not measured at below a minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit. However, these liquids are extremely cold and should be handled with the same precautions as other cryogenic liquids. Now, anytime you handle a cryogenic liquid, certain personal protective equipment is recommended. While safety glasses may be an acceptable means of protection for the eyes, it is recommended that a full face shield be used when handling these substances. Cover as much of the body as possible with clothing. This includes long sleeves and thermal or leather gloves. Now let's look at some of the characteristics of cryogenic liquids. And remember that these demonstrations were conducted under controlled conditions by trained safety professionals. We'll pour some liquid nitrogen into this beaker. Liquid nitrogen's temperature is a minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. The boiling action you see is the liquid nitrogen trying to cool the surrounding area down to its own temperature. As the beaker and the surrounding area get colder, the boiling action decreases. The soft tissue of the eye is the most sensitive part of your body to extreme cold. We'll use the petals of this flower to represent the sensitive eye tissue. We'll submerge the flower into our beaker of liquid nitrogen for a few seconds. Remove it and gently squeeze it in a gloved hand the flower shatters like crystal. To further demonstrate the embrittlement effects of extreme cold on tissue, we'll submerge this frankfurter into our liquid. Now we'll remove it, and as we tap it on the table, you will notice that it is frozen and breaks like a piece of ice. Contact with a cryogenic liquid, even a splash, can result in extreme frostbite or freeze burn. The term freeze burn is used because the actual tissue damage done by the extreme cold is very similar to that caused by heat in a fire. This phenomenon is best visualized by breaking an egg which represents human tissue into a skillet and then adding liquid nitrogen which is 320 degrees below zero. As the nitrogen vaporizes, you can see the white portion of the egg has the appearance of being cooked. If you should ever have to give first aid to someone who has a cold contact or freeze burn, the following are the recommended treatments. Remove any clothing that restricts circulation to the affected area. Do not rub any frozen part as this may cause further tissue damage. And above all, seek medical assistance as soon as possible. When working around piping or lines that contain cryogenic liquids and have frosted over due to extreme cold, care must be taken to wear protective gloves and clothing because exposed flesh will adhere to these cold pipes if contact is made. To show you how severe such an injury can be, we'll take this piece of steak and briefly contact it with our frozen pipe. As you can see, a large amount of flesh remains on the frozen pipe. In handling cryogenic liquids, the type of container used must be made of a material that will withstand the effects of extreme cold. Rubber, plastic, and some metals become very brittle when exposed to a cryogenic liquid. 
We'll take this very pliable ball and put it in our beaker of liquid nitrogen. Now we'll remove it and throw it on the table. As you can see, it doesn't bounce, it shatters. It should be apparent why we store, transfer, and transport cryogenic liquids only in containers which are specifically designed and approved for cryogenic service. Many industrial gases are liquefied in air separation plants. Maintaining the product in liquid form enables the producers to economically transport and store the product. For example, one unit of liquid nitrogen when vaporized will produce about 850 units of gaseous nitrogen. We'll put a small amount of liquid nitrogen into this container, seal it, and as the liquid vaporizes, the gas begins to fill the bag. You can see how this small amount of liquid can produce a large amount of gas. Because of the large amount of expansion produced by vaporization of a cryogenic liquid, you must remember that it may not be stored in a closed container which is not equipped to relieve pressure. To further dramatize this fact, we'll pour liquid nitrogen into this container. This time we'll seal the top of the tube and close the valve. Trapping the liquid in the container, which has been equipped with a rupture disc rated at 350 pounds per square inch. As you can see, the pressure buildup from the vaporized liquid was sufficient to blow this rupture disc. If there had been no disc to relieve the pressure, this tube could have ruptured violently. Never trap a cryogenic liquid in any type of sealed container or pipe without some type of pressure relief device. Cryogenic liquids are commonly vaporized and pumped into compressed gas cylinders such as you see here. This is a cutaway view of a high pressure cylinder. You will notice that the walls of the cylinder are thickest at the top and the bottom because this is where most of the wear of a cylinder occurs. These cylinders are designed to contain pressures of up to 6,000 pounds per square inch. The U.S. Department of Transportation requires that they be tested every five years and tested to at least five-thirds of their design pressure. In other words, a 2,400 PSI cylinder must be tested to at least 4,000 pounds per square inch. Now, anytime you use a compressed gas cylinder, read the label and confirm that it contains the type of product that you intend to use. Every cylinder transported in the United States must be labeled according to Department of Transportation regulations. The label itself basically gives the name of the product, its identification number, its hazard class of material, and any specific warnings about that product. Never rely on the color of the cylinder to determine its contents. As an additional safeguard, each cylinder is equipped with a valve that corresponds to the type of gas that it contains. These valve specifications were developed by the Compressed Gas Association in an effort to prevent the accidental connection of a gas cylinder to equipment not intended for that service. For example, this non-flammable gas valve used for argon, nitrogen, and helium has an interior threaded connection that cannot be screwed on to the threaded connection of this acetylene regulator. It will only fit a regulator designed for non-flammable gas use, such as this inert gas regulator. Similarly, this oxygen valve cannot be screwed on to an inert gas regulator. This method of standardization helps prevent a gas from being used in the wrong application. Now let's take a closer look at a high pressure cylinder valve using this cutaway. High pressure valves should only be used in one of two positions, either fully opened or fully closed. In the closed position, the gas comes out of the cylinder and is stopped by this plug. In the fully open position, the gas comes out of the cylinder and through the valve. If the valve were placed in any position other than fully open or fully closed, the gas could leak around the plug and out of the packing as you can see here. High pressure cylinder valves in non-flammable, non-toxic gas service have safeties with rupture discs that are designed to burst in the event the pressure of gas in a cylinder exceeds a safe limit. 
thus preventing damage to the cylinder itself. Valves in high pressure flammable gas service have safeties that are a combination rupture disc and fusible plug. The fusible plug will prevent the rupture disc from bursting unless the temperature is high enough to melt the fusible metal. Any high pressure cylinder can be extremely dangerous regardless of its contents if handled improperly. In the event of the cylinder valve being broken off or the cylinder otherwise punctured, the rapid release of the gas under high pressure can in fact propel the cylinder much like a missile. So whenever you have to move a cylinder, make sure the protective cap is properly attached to the cylinder. This will protect the valve, which is the weakest part of the cylinder itself. Now here are some examples of some valves from cylinders that were dropped without the cap in place. Wherever possible, a cylinder cart should be used to move cylinders as opposed to rolling them. When in use, cylinders should be secured to a fixed object such as a wall, post, or cylinder cart. Avoid freestanding cylinders. Groups of cylinders should be nested tightly together to prevent them from being easily overturned. This red cylinder is an acetylene cylinder. Now besides its obvious difference in shape, it differs from high pressure cylinders in that it is not hollow, but contains a filler material. This cutaway shows the filler material in place. It is a porous mass that contains many small cellular spaces that limit the amount of space that free acetylene in gaseous form can collect. Now acetylene in its gaseous state, when compressed to over 15 pounds per square inch, is extremely unstable and can decompose violently. It's for that reason that acetylene regulators have a red line that begins at 15 pounds per square inch that serves as a warning to the operator. In order to safely store acetylene, it must be in solution, which is accomplished by filling the cylinder with a prescribed amount of a solvent, such as acetone, which saturates the filler material. When the acetylene gas is pumped into the cylinder under pressure, it is dissolved into the solvent at a rate of 22 to 1. When the cylinder valve is open, the acetylene is released from solution and returns to its gaseous state where it can be used. Now all acetylene cylinders are equipped with safety devices at the top and or the bottom that prevent the cylinder from exploding when exposed to excessive heat. These safety devices consist of a plug with a fusible metal core that is designed to melt at a temperature of approximately 212 degrees Fahrenheit or the temperature of boiling water. When the core melts, the pressurized gas within the cylinder is freed to the atmosphere. In this controlled situation, an acetylene cylinder was placed in this bonfire. The heat from the fire melted the fuse plugs and the flame that you see is the ignited acetylene gas escaping from the cylinder through the fuse plug, thereby preventing the cylinder from exploding. When there is a large flame burning from the fuse plug or any other part of the cylinder, do not attempt to put it out unless the cylinder is outdoors or in a well-ventilated area free from any other sources of ignition. Usually these types of fires are very difficult to put out. The main reason for not extinguishing the fire is that if unburned acetylene escapes, mixes with the air, and is reignited, a space explosion is likely to occur. Although neither a fire or explosion is desirable, generally a fire is preferable. If the fuse plugs were damaged or replaced with a non-fusible plug, the cylinder could explode violently as you can see in the second bonfire test. A safety bulletin titled Handling Acetylene Cylinders in Fire Situations, which gives detailed information on how to handle acetylene cylinders in fires, is available from the Compressed Gas Association. Oxygen, in addition to being the life-sustaining element in the air that you and I breathe, has in its pure form many uses in our daily lives. It is used for welding, it is used extensively for medicine, it is even used to power the rockets that we put into space. One of the most common misconceptions about oxygen is that it is a flammable gas, when in fact it is a non-flammable gas. The confusion stems from the fact that oxygen is an oxidizer which accelerates combustion. Now this means that something that would burn at a given rate under normal circumstances will burn at a much higher and faster rate when burned in an oxygen-enriched atmosphere. 
So care should always be taken any time you're working around pure oxygen. Now to demonstrate that oxygen is a non-flammable gas, I'm going to take this match and light it. Let it burn for just a second. I'm going to pass it over this beaker of liquid oxygen. As you can see, the match burns faster and hotter, but the oxygen itself is not burning. To show you how oxygen will accelerate combustion, we'll put some fuel gas, which in this case is acetylene, into this tube. By turning the handle of the magneto, we will introduce a spark into the tube, which produces an ignition of the gas. Now we'll repeat the experiment, except this time we'll add a small amount of oxygen to the tube. First, we introduce the acetylene. Now we add the oxygen and turn the magneto handle. As you can plainly see, this time the result is a much more violent explosion involving a similar quantity of fuel gas. An oxygen acetylene torch represents a combination of the same two gases that we used in the previous demonstration. Now under controlled conditions, when these two gases are mixed together, a greater amount of work can be done because of the extreme high heat that they produce. An example of what can happen when oxygen and a flammable gas are mixed under the wrong conditions can be seen in the damage that was done to this regulator. In this accident, reverse flow check valves were not installed on the torch. The differential in pressure between the high pressure oxygen cylinder and the lower pressure acetylene cylinder allowed the oxygen gas to actually back up into the acetylene regulator. When the operator attempted to adjust the regulator, the friction was sufficient to ignite the mixture, which resulted in a hole being blown through the brass casing of the acetylene regulator. As we previously mentioned, the presence of oxygen will allow items not normally considered combustible to burn. We'll take this piece of steel wool and put a lighted match under it. As you can see, the steel wool will glow red and get hot, but it does not ignite. Now we'll drop the hot steel wool into this beaker of liquid oxygen. As you can see, there is an intense flash fire which destroys the steel wool and the beaker. We've shown you what can happen to a normally non-combustible material when burned in an oxygen-enriched atmosphere. You may be similarly exposed if you allow the clothing you wear to become saturated with pure oxygen. To demonstrate this, we have created a wire man which we have placed in this glass container. Next, we add a quantity of pure oxygen. Now we'll drop a lighted match into the container. One of history's most dramatic examples of the hazards of working in an oxygen-enriched atmosphere occurred in 1967, when three astronauts died in their capsule at Cape Kennedy. NASA was conducting an Apollo test series, during which the capsule was filled with 100% oxygen atmosphere. During the test, a short circuit provided an ignition source, which caused a flash fire and resulted in the deaths of the three astronauts. Oxygen and any hydrocarbon-based material such as oil or grease, when mixed and provided with the source of ignition, can be considered a potentially explosive combination. To illustrate, we'll put this paper cup that has a small amount of grease in it into this mechanical device called a drop hammer. Now we'll add some liquid oxygen and allow it to chemically react with the grease. When the hammer is dropped, heat of compression is developed, which will represent the source of ignition for this demonstration. We'll step back a safe distance and let the hammer drop. The oxygen and grease combustion or explosion you have just seen requires a source of ignition or heat in order to complete the fire triangle. This required heat can be produced by friction, compression, 
or from a spark or flame. Here is an oxygen regulator that someone oiled in air. When the operator opened the valve, the oxygen flowing into the regulator created a sufficient amount of heat to cause an ignition. As you can see, the handle was blown off, the gauge was essentially destroyed, and a hole was blown through the casing of the regulator. If the operator had been standing in front of this regulator when the explosion occurred, he could have been seriously injured. Now, frequently, oxygen is incorrectly referred to as air. Such an error has resulted in the use of compressed oxygen to power air tools. Now, because these air tools are heavily oiled and create a great deal of friction, a dangerous situation exists. Never use oxygen as a substitute for air. Unlike oxygen, other industrial gases such as argon, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide will not support life. These gases can produce an atmosphere where the oxygen is displaced. Oxygen starvation produces effects and symptoms as reported by the Compressed Gas Association in its pamphlet, SB2. As a practical demonstration, we'll subject a laboratory rat to an atmosphere in which we will displace his normal breathing air with nitrogen. It is important to note that many gases, including nitrogen, are odorless and colorless, which would not be detected until the onset of symptoms which you have previously seen. As you can see, the animal is very active in this contained area under normal conditions. Now we'll begin to introduce the nitrogen. The animal begins to lose consciousness. He is, of course, unable to help himself. If continued, his breathing will eventually stop and death will occur. When removed immediately from the nitrogen atmosphere and given artificial respiration, the animal will again be revived and continue with normal activity. Any time you work in an area where the oxygen could have been displaced by another gas, you should use an oxygen meter to ensure that you have a safe oxygen atmosphere before entering. And you should continue to monitor the atmosphere until your job is completed. When a worker is overcome by an oxygen deficient atmosphere and his breathing has stopped, immediate action is necessary. Remove the victim from the exposure area begin artificial respiration and call for medical assistance. Warning, when entering a suspected oxygen deficient atmosphere for the purposes of rescue, do so only when equipped with the necessary self-contained breathing apparatus and lifeline. History has shown that rescue attempts in such an atmosphere by individuals holding their breath have resulted in multiple deaths. You have just seen an overview of some of the hazards involved in handling liquefied and compressed gases. Remember to always use the safe handling procedures prescribed for the type of product that you'll be using. The use of good common sense and the appropriate safety equipment will go a long way toward reducing your chances of becoming an injury statistic. The demonstrations you have just seen have been performed by specially trained and qualified safety personnel under controlled conditions. Never attempt to duplicate these demonstrations as they may result in serious injury or death.